I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see I'm not as think as I smart I am Welcome to the Brains Matter podcast This is episode 8 for the 5th of December 2006 I'm the ordinary guy and I'll bring you stories on science curiosities knowledge and anything else that's interesting On today's episode I've got an interview with Michael Feller from Monash University. Michael did research into the source of some of the philosophies behind Nazism and modern-day links to places that you probably wouldn't really think of initially. So before going into too much more detail here, I'll just get into the interview. I've got Michael Feller with me from Monash University. He's just completed an honours paper on the Aryan Connection, Indo-European Spirituality and Civilization and um, he's from the School of Historical Studies at Monash, and he's agreed to kindly have an interview with me today. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you. So, Michael, tell me a little bit about your, your research and what you discovered. Well, uh, when I began this research, it would have been in uh, October 2005, um, what I, I always asked myself um, if there was any connection um, between swastika that you see used in temples um, throughout Asia and the swastika that um, the Nazis employed um, leading to and during the uh, Second World War. Um, obviously, there would, I would think there would be no um, connection between religions like Buddhism and Hinduism and what Nazism stood for, but I was curious to think that the Nazis took a symbol which was so commonly applied in, in the East so uh, I began to, to research this and find that there was uh, actually um, a, conscious, a conscious connection that the Nazis made with their swastika and uh, the swastikas of the Orient. And in fact, um, the very purpose of using the swastika as a symbol um, for the Third Reich was that it symbolised the Aryan race. And the Aryan race most people associate with... Uh, with Nazis, but uh, Arya is a Sanskrit word mm -hmm. coming from India, and uh, the Aryans recur throughout Hindu texts and, and Buddhist texts. Uh, indeed, the Buddha was um, supposedly an Aryan. What's an Aryan? Well, well, it's interesting that you mention that because I saw a documentary on SBS of all channels a, a little while ago. And they had a documentary around what the um, Germans, this was probably the late 30s or mid to late 30s at the time, and they were actually sent to Tibet to try and find what was described in the documentary as the true Aryans, I'll use that in quotes, mm. the true Aryans, and to find how they would relate to, back to the Germanic tribes. Yeah, that's right. The, um, the Aryans, according to European scholarship in the 18th and 19th century, were um, a tribe of people from Central Asia, they theorised, who uh, invaded the Indian subcontinent. Um, that theory um, is still uh, very contentious today. But, that's, um, that's the Aryan invasion theory. The Aryan invasion theory, that's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone listening from India uh, will, probably, will probably know about that. But um, these Europeans are uh, scholars mainly in Germany, some in, some in England, um, most famous being, say, Sir William Jones, who founded the Asiatic Society of uh, Bengal. Mm -hmm. um, these Europeans theorised that uh, a, a tribe of, of white people living in uh, Central Asia thousands and thousands of years ago invaded India and um, created um, what today is Hindu civilization. And um, the Germans in the, in the 30s, yes, they did indeed send an expedition there because they thought that uh, perhaps there would be pockets of um, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Germans still living in, in valleys in Tibet. Um, there was much speculation in the 30s about Tibet. Very few Europeans had travelled there at that stage and um, there was this whole image of uh, a Shangri-La, a, a paradise which had been, uh, which was pure and um, with the European racial thought uh, overlaying that, um, that, that purity was, was racial as well, I suppose. You mentioned the swastika a little bit earlier. Um, it's it's kind of interesting because it's a symbol that I've seen everywhere. I've been to India many times, and um, you see the what they call Suvasati, which is the Sanskrit, which you know you could uh, contract down to swastika, which mm. is another common form of it. And there's the right-handed swastika, or mm. Suvasati, and there's the left-handed, and they both have different meanings. That's right. And I did read in your paper that um, there was a 
a theory that it was reversed to symbolise evil, but that's mm. not quite true. That's um, right. I don't know what the actual SS reason was for turning it the way it is, but there is a, an appearance difference there. The, the Hindu and um, Buddhist ones actually have, apart from the dots that you mentioned in your papers, they're actually sitting horizontally, whereas the German SS symbol is turned at 45 degrees, and it was very specific as well. It was, it was a black swastika on a white background, on a white circle with a crimson background. Mm. But today, everyone views anything that looks remotely like it as a symbol of evil. Yeah. Well, the in terms of um, my understanding of the uh, 45 degree angled uh, swastika, uh, black on white background with a um, surrounded by crimson. Um, that was Hitler was um, Hitler was a graphic artist uh, as well as a, as a painter, and, then, and yeah. um, he designed that flag. But uh, prior to that design, the swastika in various forms, uh, horizontal, uh, facing both ways, was uh, used by various esoteric societies in uh, <coughs> Germany and Austria um, as part of what is known as the uh, Volkisch movement. Um, that was a movement um, which uh, in up against modernity and industrialization attempted to bring Germany back to its uh, perhaps its pagan roots or at least its uh, what was deemed its romantic or its natural roots um, people living in forest etc etc they identified mm -hmm. the swastika symbol as as an old Norse symbol um, it wasn't that the swastika was black or was at a 45 degree angle or anything like that um, that's just how Hitler, I suppose, applied it to a flag. Mm -hmm. But you can, if you uh, examine um, Nazi imagery, um, even during the Second World War, that there's various swastikas, some horizontal, some um, done in various ways, some slightly hooked or curved. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly in the neo-Nazi movement today, um, they employ various designs of the swastika. And apart from the subcontinent, it also appears in um, South American tribal uh, mm. cultures as well, like. I'm not sure whether it was the Aztec or Incas, but one of those, I can't recall which one, had similar kinds of uh, symbols. Yeah. And um, it's got a rich history, even in, in the US, mm. um, where, you know, apart from Germany, where it's actually illegal to, to portray one anywhere at the moment. And um, before I go on, I must say that Michael and I are discussing this in terms of its relation to historical um, pieces, but we're not in any way supporting or putting forward a particular view, because I know this is a very contentious mm. topic in many areas of the world, so I just want to mention that before we go on. But the American Air Force actually used to have a swastika on its lapels mm. before the 1930s. Yeah, there was actually a, um, a division of the Air Force which had a swastika. Um, the swastika is like a, it's fundamentally, it's a, it's a geometric type shape. It's like mm. a circle or a square. Nobody has a franchise over it. Yeah. Um, the fact that the Nazis adopted it didn't mean that it was a uniquely Aryan symbol. They said it was, but that's uh, yes. When you when you look at it, it appears in South America, it appears in North America amongst the Native Americans. Um, you know, it appears it appears virtually everywhere. It actually, in fact, um, appears in uh, in ancient Jewish temples, Roman temples as well. Um, mm -hmm. So the fact that the Jews were using the swastika too just illustrates how absurd. Um, the Nazi theories about the swastika were. Yeah, it makes it ironic, given the current feel about the symbol itself, yeah. doesn't it? It's the symbol is is merely that it's a symbol, um, but it's interesting it's how how that symbol represents is so uh, emotive now. Um, it was it was back then um, when it was it was understood um, in many circles that this actually was a symbol of a unified Aryan race and an Aryan race of um, Europeans, which uh, was uh, once much larger than just the European continent, mm -hmm. but extended, um, they argued, um, down to uh, down to uh, Bengal. Mm -hmm. And it, also, depending on who you talk to, the Aryans might have been um, based around Central Asia or Eurasia, or they mm. could have been northern subcontinent, or they could have been no Norse. There is no actual definitive proof of no. who they were or how far they extended. And given the, um, you know, I've, I've got a big interest in evolutionary theory as well. Yeah. And given what they found with um, genetics as well, that there is no conclusive proof that there oh, no. were 
Europeans in northern, well, there obviously were at one point, especially with Alexander the Great coming across, mm. but there wasn't proof of anyone there before, but that's not to say it's definitive one way or the other. Yeah, precisely, but it's interesting that um, the Aryan theory was never actually a, an ethnological or racial theory. It originated as a linguistic theory, and in fact, if you do analyse language, um, there is a very strong connection between languages of the subcontinent and languages of Europe. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, they're called Indo-European languages. At one stage, they were called Aryan languages or Indo-German mm -hmm. and Indo-German languages, in fact. Um, and uh, they, they include Persian, they include Hindi, Urdu, um, Russian, German, French, English, mm -hmm. basically the whole, the whole spectrum. It, 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 that's a very good point you make about languages. There's a lot of commonality between them. I'm not very um, au fait with Hindi itself, but if you take a lot of the, the European languages, take French, just counting to three, for example, un, deux, trois, that's a U or O sound, a T sound, and no, so D sound and a, and a T sound. Mm. Italian, uno, due, tre, which is very similar. Mm. In Hindi, you've got ek, do, tin, very yeah. similar consonant exactly. sounds. Exactly. And words like mother and father, very basic words, are very similar, you know, thousands of miles apart. And uh, I suppose the European scholars in the 18th and 19th century thought, well, if the languages are similar, perhaps the races are similar. And uh, if you look at a Northern Indian and a European, or and then um, an East Asian, the racial similarities between a Northern Indian and a, and a European are much are actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. There are many um, there are many Europeans who look who could fit in into India and there are many Indians who could easily fit into uh, into Europe. Absolutely. Just on a you know pure you know myopic skin base skin colour basis. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So um and, and, and look, i d um I'm no expert in, in race or, or language. Then there quite probably is a grain of truth to what the Nazis were saying, but the fact that they they overlaid this with concepts of um, master races and destiny and things like that, and that's where the whole uh, Indo-European theory became really discredited. Mm -hmm. But it is in fact a serious serious theory that um, serious scholars still uh, are still working on. And there was a lot of um, bastardisation of concepts by the Nazis. Oh yeah, forgive that phrase, but mm. um, Arya or Aryan means noble, for example. And then of course what they did with the swastika, and then what they did with their own views of nationalism and mm. um, something else you mentioned in, in your papers as well is there's a bit of a resurgence of that happening at the moment. Yeah, the idea that the, the Aryans, Aryan means noble, maybe in a spiritual sense, if in, in um, perhaps a more pure interpretation of Hindu texts, but um, certainly the Nazis um, took that to mean that the Aryans were a noble race, therefore a master race. And um, what I've researched is how um, that idea that Aryans are a noble race has come full circle and um, today elements within the Hindu nationalist movement and the far right in India are um, employing that little theory about um, the superiority of um, the Aryans, mm -hmm. but in this case the Indo-Aryans. Yeah, you, you make mention of that in, in your paper as well. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about the similarities you saw with the, the far right of um, Indian Indian Aryans and the Indian right compared to what the uh, the Germans were doing in the 30s and 40s. Mm. Well, there's um, there's certainly huge differences between modern day India and um, Germany in the 30s and 40s. There's economic differences. India, um, they say India is shining in the 30s. Germany was anything but. Um, and also, of course, um, racially, uh, Germany was um, much more homogenous and. Um, the Jews were a distinct minority, whereas India is a nation, effectively, of minorities. Um, now, uh, but there are there are similarities in uh, in the sense that far right groups in India and Germany, if you analyse their um, their language and their, their propaganda, there's a lot of similar themes. Mm -hmm. There's, um, for instance, the uh, the Hindu nationalist right. Um, Extreme right, I'll say, not not all Hindu nationalist groups certainly, uh, but the extreme fringes of these groups um, will portray uh, Muslims and Christians in India as being um, parasites on Indian society. And um, in fact, uh, people like Bal Thackeray in Bombay have openly declared that uh, you know the uh, that Hitler was right to do what he did to the Jews of Germany. 
because the Jews of Germany were fundamentally the same as what the Muslims are to India. Mm -hmm. And um, he's uh, he's been called the Hitler of India in the press. I, I think he's actually um, called himself the Hitler of India, okay. things like that. Um, now, I think his his political party is um, is uh, declining in popularity, um, hopefully, anyway. <laughs> but uh, there are there are similarities. A, a restaurant opened in uh, Bombay. I don't know what. Um, you you think about this, but it's called itself Hitler's Cross, and there was a huge poster of the Führer on the wall and uh, swastikas everywhere. Is it? Do you know if it's still standing? Um, I think it is. The um, the Bombay's Jewish community lodged a formal complaint, and so did the um, the Embassy of Israel in India. But um, last I heard, it was still operational. Yeah, um, that's a little surprising. Actually. The uh, the owner said it was for publicity purposes only, and it did not reflect his political opinion. But um, one wonders. Um, that uh, how many other where else uh, a restaurant about Hitler could mm. could could do good business. In um, you, you mentioned that you've also just returned from India and Pakistan as well. Mm. Um, what was the purpose of your visit? And what did you find there? Uh, well, that visit was um, wasn't um, research focused. Um, an earlier visit to India um, was. Um, I interviewed um, members of the. Uh, the very small Jewish community in Bombay, as well as um, members of the Hindu and Muslim communities, about this issue, and um, there is an acknowledgement that um, underneath the surface there is this, there are these um, these radical groups emerging. Um, it certainly hasn't hit mainstream mainstream politics yet. Arguably, you could say that the Hindu the, the far right. The Indian nationalist movements always existed. They assassinated Gandhi. They uh, are responsible for riots in mm -hmm. um, all over India. Um, thousands of people have been killed in in the last few years, in fact. But this more Nazified strain hasn't yet, I think, risen to the surface. Yet certainly, if one looks on the internet, um, the word Google searches Hindu and Nazi, um, they'll actually be surprised about how much how many hits come up. Um, Do these groups actually yeah. uh, identify themselves as Nazi or neo-Nazi? Definitely. Um, there's uh, there's various uh, social networking websites like MySpace and so forth where mm -hmm. um, Hindu youth will um, will have on like favourite books things like Mein Kampf and we'll talk about Aryans now. Um, these kids and they're mainly kids. Um, I don't think you know fully understand the context of what they're talking about. So um, I don't know. If they could be considered to be, you know, true hardcore neo-Nazis, because they probably mm -hmm. don't really understand what a neo-Nazi is in the Western sense of the word, but um, but certainly they uh, there is a fascination with Hitler and there's a fascination with his mm -hmm. his views on Aryans and his utilization of the swastika in particular. Do you think their views of the Aryans are in terms of the Indian sense of the word Aryan, which is Northern Indian, all the people from the Indus Valley mm -hmm. region, and um, of course, the Western view is the uh, the Hitlerized view, mm. which is the blue-eyed blonde. Mm. So there could be a bit of a difference there, but perhaps. But they seem to be confusing. About, yeah, perhaps they're talking about the concepts of the racial superiority. Yeah, well, they um, there's there's one um, internet forum called the Pan Aryan National Front um, that uh, I um, I looked at, and um, there was in fact a an, an Indian member of this forum who was arguing with uh, presumably the, the white American members of this forum that uh, no, in fact, he was a true Aryan and his skin was a little darker, but he was still just as Aryan as they were and mm -hmm. that Hitler included people like him in his vision. If you analyse Hitler's writings on India, Hitler certainly didn't consider Indians to be uh, true, full-blooded Aryans. But uh, That's kind of interesting because if you if he didn't consider them to be true Aryans and then he still sent the expedition to find mm. what he claimed at the time were the true well, Aryans. Well, Nazi, Nazi Germany um, was, a, was a big place. Um, there were certainly members of his administration who believed that the Indians were, were Aryan. Mm -hmm. um, there's certainly uh, members of the diplomatic corps, people who were posted to um, places like Calcutta and Bombay before the war, certainly had affinity with uh, India, certainly Indology and um, studies of India was huge in Germany at the time. Sanskrit was, Germany was the centre of Sanskrit studies, mm -hmm. still is in fact the centre of Sanskrit studies one could argue. Hitler himself, no, he didn't consider, the, he considered the Indians to be um, 
bastardized offspring of Aryans intermingling with um, with Dravidians. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to explain to all the listeners, the Dravidians were the natives of the south, south of India. Southern Indians, yeah. say, a um, darker, darker skinned people. Um, I've got no personal views on the validity of such claims, but um, that's certainly what Hitler thought. Mm-hmm. Um, he used words like bastard and uh, and so forth, and his fear was that um, Germany, in fact, would end up like India. Um, that's uh, that's documented um, in his in his uh, in his private um, observations. There's a book, um, Hitler's Table Talk. Uh, I think that's the title of the book, and mm-hmm. um, it includes comments such as these. It, it, trying to get a, a, a pure race, which is what Hitler seemed to be trying to do, is is a very ironic concept because the history of the Germanic tribes or the, or the Teutons was that they were a nomadic tribe who used mm. to travel around Europe oh, and course. pick up people as they went along and integrate well, them within their tribe. As, in, as is, you know, fundamentally every every race, like uh, there's really, if you if you really look into it, there's really no scientific. I believe there's no scientific basis for the concept of race. That fundamentally humans have more in common than they have yeah, differences. differences. And and that's absolutely right. The the whole concept of race itself, and this is stepping outside. Um, what you mentioned in your thesis, but um, in doing reading, depending on which set of scientific biology you read into, there's either three or four races, mm. um, Caucasoids, Mongoloids and Negroids, and even then, anyone from the 70s onwards claim that that's all rubbish anyway. Yeah, that's right, and, and the distinctions just blur. Um, certainly you can, you can notice differences between people, but... Um, and on a scientific the, basis. The modern, modern claim is that that's just evolution depending on ge- geography. Yeah, and, and funnily enough, that was the original view as well before um, race science developed um, to the way that culminated with Hitler um, in the 18th century. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you look at um, ship's journals from um, the 15th and 16th centuries, um, the Europeans, uh, like the fleets, the Portuguese and Spanish fleets that would... Um, Sail south, either to South America or to uh, to Af- around Africa. They actually, believe that if they lived in Africa, they they in their own lifetime would would become would become mm-hmm. Negro. So uh, a little bit short, but yeah, <laughs> they would, might eventually get there mm. after several generations. Um, tell me a little bit about what you discovered about the the Greek lady who called herself Savitri Devi Mukaji. Yeah, that's was, an interesting story. Savitri Devi, um, she was. Um, in the in the twenties, she was a she was a Greek woman um, who did her uh, doctorate in ancient Greek paganism, and um, she she was very enthusiastic about Hitler's rise to power in Germany. She saw him as a neo-pagan himself, utilizing symbols like the swastika, and um, with his strong environmentalism and sense of animal rights, vegetarianism. Mm-hmm. Um, and so forth, and uh, she. Had By the way, that there, you already know this, but they're also very common with the the Brahmins in India. As exactly, well. mm-hmm. and she'd done a little study about um, Brahmanism and so forth, and she had a basic understanding, as many Europeans did, that uh, the Aryans of Europe and India were fundamentally linked, mm-hmm. that it was just a distance and um, and time which separated them. She uh, she was very enthusiastic about Hitler removing Christian and Jewish elements from Europe and returning Europe to its glorious pagan past mm-hmm. as embodied in ancient Greece and Rome. But she thought, first we need to find a template for this grand vision. So she actually travelled to India and spent decades there observing Indian society. And actually, uh, during the 30s and 40s, she worked for the Hindu mission in Calcutta, distributing pamphlets and books, writing books about... Um, how good Hindus um, should never marry into Muslims and should learn how to fight and defend themselves against the uh, forthcoming war with Islam once the British leave India. Mm. So she she was really, I suppose, the godmother of um, this this strain of neo-Nazism today, which um, heavily uses Hindu and Buddhist themes in its texts and also the. the the sub movement in Hindu nationalism today that incorporates Nazi themes. If you if you look her up on the internet, for instance, um, you find a lot of references to her in neo Nazi websites. And mm-hmm. there's actually this very curious strain of neo Nazism in the West, in Europe and America, that uh, 
that celebrates true European culture as a fundamentally Hindu or Buddhist culture. Okay. But the one that, uh, and that Hindu and Buddhism are not Asiatic, but in fact European. So that's a whole interesting field that um, historians are yet to... Justifications they've got mm. for that one. Yeah. You mentioned that um, just before that there was a hopeful return to the glorious days of paganism in Europe, but I was reading somewhere that the Nazis actually used to use um, a, a lot of passages from the Bible, mm. actually the same passages from the Bible that um, the South Africans used under apartheid to yeah. um, justify their views. They did. And one of the things that they used to do um, to weed out what they called Jewish spies was to actually make them drop their pants. Mm. And if they were circumcised, then obviously to them it was a Jewish spy. And if they weren't, they were Christian because in the letters from um, St. Paul to the Romans, he claimed that Christians shouldn't be circumcised. So that was yeah. their way. True. So it, it, you also mentioned within, um, quite correctly within your papers that the, Sem- the Semites were Christians, Arabs, and the Jews together. So it's mm. a little bit issues. bizarre that... You could you could argue that this type of uh, Nazism or neo-Nazism, the modern version of it, would almost seem anti-Semitic. But then the Nazi version of it was promoting one form of that Semitism anyway. Mm. Well, the the whole construct, in my opinion, of Semite and Aryan is fundamentally flawed anyway. But to the Nazis, they were in power for 12 years only, and they were certainly very opportunistic, at least in the early days, um, about utilising uh, Christian symbology to justify and to popularise their uh, their standpoints. Um, it could be argued that had the Nazis won the war, and uh, decades later, perhaps you would have seen a more pagan style of Nazism emerge and mm-hmm. certainly there were Nazi philosophers and um, uh, members of the party who espoused a certain paganism but there were also very Christian Nazis, um, the members of the church, the clergy who were members of the party and so forth. Mm-hmm. Hitler himself um, was a believer in God um, but he identified with the, uh, the Catholic Church um, yeah. although he didn't um, actively practice. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again um, Men like Heinrich Himmler were very enthusiastic paganists, mm-hmm. and um, there was, a, in fact, a strong movement within the party, especially within the SS organisation, um, to create a new pagan church for Germany based on Norse myth mm-hmm. and um, Aryan religion. And um, as part of that attempt to create an Aryan religion, there was a lot of research being done right up until 1945, in fact, on Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, there were Sanskritists even employed in the SS, um, they actually had quite high ranks, some of them, mm-hmm. um, specifically to um, to research what the uh, what the religion of the Germans should be, okay. what their spirituality should be, and that was um, the topic of one of my papers. Mm-hmm. Was that um, that attempt to Aryanize? We've talked a lot about what the Germans have done in the past, a little bit about what's happening in in modern India with the far right. Um, nationalist parties. Mm. Do you see this as becoming an increasing problem or is it simmering down because there's a, you, you would have seen in the media a lot the, the uh, comparisons between Bush and Hitler for example and mm. a lot of the philosophies and concepts he's using and the, and the terminology he's using to say with us or against us and a lot of it sounds very familiar. Mm. Um, is it a slow move to the right politically in our modern world or What's your view on that? I don't know. Look, Hitler said many things, and anyone can. Um, there's a, you know, you could say anybody like, oh, the Nazi. If you if you eat an apple, well, I'm sure Hitler did that once. So you know, yeah. does that mean you're a Nazi? I don't know. Does it mean George Bush is a Nazi if he uses what most politicians throughout history have have used? I'm sure there's been very um, admirable politicians have used "Are you with us or against us?" Mm-hmm. type dichotomies, but. Um, Certainly, in terms of, is the world moving to the right? Um, because the reason why I ask that is because you, you used to see a lot of protests for things that people didn't like in the 60s, 70s, and even early 80s. But in the late 80s onwards, when something happened, people would say, "I don't like that idea," but there wouldn't be much happening around it. Like a protest today is nothing on what a protest in the 60s hmm. or 70s was. Well, certainly you could argue that we're becoming more individualistic. Whether that means that we're um, gravitating towards the far right, I don't know. Certainly in India, um, this uh, 
what I would call Nazified extreme Hindu nationalism, that's definitely an underground thing. That's not a prominent thing. Mm -hmm. um, most people have never heard of such a thing, but um, it's it's there. It exists. I don't know. Will it increase? I hope not. But um, certainly, um, with the with the arrival of the internet, people of extreme persuasions are now able to find friends who agree with them. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, say you're you're an average Indian 18 year old. You develop these ideas through what you read or what you have been taught by someone chances are you're not going to find someone within your immediate geographical circle of acquaintances who would mm -hmm. agree with you if you say worship hitler for instance however on the internet you can find someone in america or someone in germany or someone wherever who will actually agree with you and that will give you a sense of uh i suppose strength identity. and uh, identity and mm -hmm. um, those identities can build i don't know if i'm able to make a comment on that yet, but um, it'd certainly be an interesting thing to, to watch over the next, say, decade or two, mm -hmm. see if anything does emerge. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, research has been conducted in academia about that very topic. Okay. So, so where to from here? You've, you've done research on, on what you've discussed today. There's um, a lot more that we can talk about, but unfortunately time is uh, running short for us. I'll try and get you back for another interview at some stage and perhaps we can explore some other topics but um, where to from here for Michael Feller? Uh, well I'm taking a, a break at the moment but um, when I, um, I'm planning to pursue a doctorate um, whether I uh, decide to write a doctoral thesis on this very topic I'm not sure yet I hope that uh, other, histori other historians in, to, a, to an extent are picking these topics up There's, you could probably count them on one hand people who've written about this then again it's all what's been written has generally been written in the past five years so I mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fairly sure that um, over the next few years we're going to see a bit more research in this area and I think it's uh, well deserved um, because whilst it may be a very fringe movement um, Hinduized neo-Nazism or Nazified um, na Hindu nationalism whilst that might be whilst those uh, movements might be on the fringes, they're certainly espousing dangerous beliefs and uh, I hope uh, people begin to notice this and um, before it potentially gets out of control. Uh, going back to a point you made before, maybe maybe it's just a, just a recognition of it that's becoming more prominent now thanks to places like the internet, maybe it's exactly the same as it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. So. Perhaps it is. Is just being recognised more, but that being said, certainly is something to keep an eye on and mm. make sure uh, it doesn't increase. What would you do to prevent it? That's a tough question, I know. But oh, well, um, I suppose if uh, we just teach our children um, that uh, we're all one human race, and it's, uh, it's it's up to it's up to schools and parenting, I suppose. But it's also, uh, in a wider sense, um, up to society at large just to monitor these trends. There's certainly very Lots of um, anti-defamation leagues mm -hmm. around the world who uh, who are designed to prevent the emergence of racial groups. But uh, we can all play our part by just espousing more um, cosmopolitan theories. I think absolutely. So there you go, folks. As heard from Michael Feller, knowledge is the key. Yeah. So the more you learn, the better you off you will be. So thank you, Michael, for your time. No problem. Thank you. And if any listeners have any questions or comments then feel free to send them through to me and I'll pass them on to Michael who will uh, be happy to answer them no doubt. Yep. I'd like to thank Michael for appearing on the show and I hope you enjoyed that interview. Thank you once again for listening to the Brains Matter podcast. This has been episode 8 for the 5th of De December 2006. If you've got any comments, questions, suggestions or you want to ask Michael anything please drop me an email or leave a comment on the website at www.brainsmatter.com. You can find all the older podcasts there on the site and let me know how you found the podcast. I'll leave a pin in the Frapper map which is on the right hand side in the blog roll and feel free to donate via PayPal via the links on the website. I hope you enjoyed the show. Bye for now. I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I smart I am I'm not as think as I thought I might be for that clear anybody to see 
I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I smart. I am. I'm not as think as I clever I would be. I'm not half as clever as me.